right, so then I would like to start, uh, unless someone has an objection, it's like a wedding, right? Like if anyone here feels that this event should not happen, please log off of Zoom because we do not want to hear from you. All right, um, so I have a, I'm gonna do a little blurb so that people have some context. Um, hi everyone, thanks so much for being here. My name is Michael Littman and I've been serving as Sam's dissertation advisor. And to kick things off, I am required to read the following message from Brown University's Graduate School. This is the final examination of Sam Saarinen for the degree of Doctor of Philosophy in Computer Science. The candidate has satisfied the course requirements for the degree of Doctor of Philosophy in Computer Science, conveniently. The candidate now appears for the final examination on the thesis entitled Query Strategies for Directed Graphical Models and their application to adaptive testing. All right, so that's the, that's the blurb. Uh, just to give a little bit more context, in addition to me, I think I was just saying this, we have several other faculty members here. Uh, Sri Ram Krishnamurti and Stephen Bach are officially serving as committee members. I wanna thank you both for your participation in this process. Uh, Sri Ram and Kathy Fissler, who's also here in particular, helped ground Sam's efforts in the relevant education literature, for which I am very, very grateful. <laughs> Before I turn is that your way of saying like you take no responsibility? So if somebody's yeah, if, annoyed at this, like go yell at. I I think that's what just happened. Yeah, very it's slickly done. Passing the buck. Yeah, um, yeah. So before I turn things over to Sam, I wanted to say a few words about him. Sam joined my group on the recommendation of my colleague Judy Goldsmith, who is here. Uh, Judy works at the boundary between theoretical computer science and artificial intelligence, and that seemed like a very relevant skill set to me. So I was I was happy to. To, to bring Sam on board. And it turned out that Sam was a wonderful combination of intelligence, creativity, and commitment. And you're gonna see all, all of these elements in his talk today. His intelligence comes through in the hard technical problems that he solves. His commitment comes through in his choice of problems to work on. Making a difference in education is an honest motivation behind his efforts. It's not only a fascinating source of computer science problems. And creativity, well, I began to realize how in touch Sam was with his creative side when he shared some of his machine learning raps with me. Now, he won't be rapping in this talk, but he will share a piece of creative writing that really stands out in the context of the 50 or 60 dissertation defenses I've attended over the years. Now, personally, I value intellect, creativity, and education very, very highly. So it gives me great pleasure to turn things over to Sam Saranen. All right, thank you for that introduction, Michael. I am going to uh, start sharing my slides now. And I think my heart rate just went up like 10 beats per minute. So this is, uh, this is it. Um, welcome to my talk. Uh, before I get really down to business, um, there are a few people I wanna thank. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank my committee members. I'd like to thank my co-authors and collaborators. Um, I'd like to give a special thank you to Michael um, Michael has been my research advisor for the past five years, and he's not the kind of person who would tell you how stressful uh, that is, but I am, so I'm going to tell you. Um, Michael and I have had conversations that went like this, not once, but multiple times. Uh, I would come to Michael and say, here's a cool plot, check it out. Michael would say, nice. I would say, do you think we can publish this in AAAI? Michael would say, sure, when's the deadline? I would say tomorrow. So uh, Michael, thank you. I would not be the researcher or the person that I am today if it weren't for the past five years with you. Thanks, and I think if, to quote Sriram, I do believe that you're passing the buck in case things don't go well. <laughs> <laughs> He's learned so quickly, Michael. It took you a long time to get to that point. He's already mastered the skill. That means he's gonna graduate. <laughs> Well, everyone else should also thank Michael uh, for the format of this talk, because when I'd originally conceived it, I was thinking I'd do it as three parts thesis defense, one part stand-up comedy. But after uh, conferring with Michael, I had to concede that I would be sitting down for most of this talk. So uh, thanks again, Michael. Okay, on that note, <clears throat> why are we here? This is maybe the most important question we can answer. And uh, for you all, the answer should be obvious. You're here to hear my talk. So the question is, why am I here? And 
I decided some time ago that I wanted to maximize the positive impact that my life has on the world. And this is a non-trivial optimization problem. I'm a fairly normal person, and there are a lot of constraints on what I can feasibly accomplish with my life. If I wanted to just tackle a really big problem like global poverty or climate change, I would not be able to say double the number of good ideas um, in combating those problems. So I spent some time looking around for sources of leverage. How can I increase the impact that I could have as an individual on the problems that really matter? What I landed on was education. Maybe I can't personally double the number of good ideas in a particular field, but by improving education, making it more scalable, maybe I can double the number of people who are generating good ideas for one of these problems. So initially, I had this roadmap of have a lot of great ideas about how to make education better, test which ideas are good, and then run with the best one. Uh, this is not how it works in reality. It turns out that this middle step of evaluating how good an educational idea is, is actually really hard. Um, developing assessments that give uh, research results in terms of what's effective for teaching, um, it's really expensive to build them, it takes a lot of time, and a lot of times the results aren't that conclusive. And just to put a maybe a wrapper around what we're talking about here, um, I'm focused on topical diagnostic assessments. That is for a single topic, uh, diagnosing or identifying what a student knows or how they're thinking about a topic. And this is something we're all familiar with, right? This takes the form of say clicker questions or in-class quizzes or review activities. Anything that you as an instructor might do in order to get information about what your students know. So as instructors, you might be saying, well, I come up with quizzes all the time. How hard is it? And I'm going to have to ask for your humility here. Um, there are a number of well-documented problems with just writing your own quizzes. Um, the first one is called the expert blind spot. The more that you know about a topic, the harder it is for you to fit the mindset of a non-expert or someone who has even zero knowledge about the topic. There are things that initiates to a topic might be thinking that are literally unthinkable to you as an expert because they're so far away from what you know to be true about the subject. This is compounded or, or maybe um, shows up you know, when we see something called fragile student knowledge. Uh, lots of times students will appear to understand something, but then when we ask them to answer seemingly identical questions about the topic or transfer their skills to a, a seemingly identical task, they fail at it. Um, and so there's a lot of overfitting going on from the student side, and that can be very hard to catch as an instructor where you're aware of the things that you've presented, the way that you think about things, and students have expectations about how they'll be evaluated. The final problem, and this is a pretty big one, is that with a small class and uh, without doing it carefully, there's no statistical validation that what you're assessing is actually measuring what you think. There's all kinds of reasons why questions can be ineffective for measuring what students know. It could be that the answer to the question was given away by another question on your exam. Uh, it could be that the question is poorly worded and is actually testing for English language ability rather than the topic that you want. Um, caveat being, if you're giving an English assessment, maybe that is what you want to test. So these problems are really common, and in order to address them, there's a, a kind of traditional process for building rigorous research assessments or assessment instruments um, for testing educational interventions. And this is a really expensive process because experts are required at every step of the process. They start off by deciding what they're going to assess and then they try and uh, say talk with students, figure out what are some things that students might be thinking about this topic, and they try to design questions that help elicit those underlying mental models. They try to distinguish between students who understand or don't understand the content. They then administer those questions in large batches on multiple classes uh, in order to test whether or not they're actually measuring what they think they're measuring. And uh, in order to collect all those statistics, it takes a long time. You have to synchronize with multiple classes. You have to be involved in uh, distributing and even the administration of the assessment. And then at the end, experts look at all of the data 
and they realize inevitably that some of the questions could be improved or uh, some of them were confusing. And so they have to go back to the design phase and iterate on the questions and conduct interviews with students and then administer them again in large batches and so on and so forth until hopefully eventually converging to a, a reasonable assessment. Just to give an idea of how prohibitive uh, this process is, computer science education has been around for around 50 years. And in all of computer science education, there are exactly three statistically validated assessments that are usable for education research. And to put this in context, Brown Computer Science teaches 41 classes in the spring alone that have an instructor. So we have 41 plus classes in the CS department per semester, and there are exactly three instruments that potentially could be used to do research in those classes on how to improve the way we teach. And unfortunately, because of curricular differences and design differences, like using a different language, um, actually none of these assessments are directly applicable to the Brown Computer Science curriculum. So this is a really inauspicious place to be if you, like me, want to do research that ends up improving education. So what I've proposed is that we alter this process. We try and remove the need for experts in this inner loop of designing questions and then evaluating the questions. And what we're going to do is instead of trying to come up with the best questions possible from the very beginning, we're going to try and collect a large collection of questions which with enough variability in their quality, hopefully some of the best of that set will be equivalent to what we might get from an expert design process. And so rather than being a, a constructive process, this will be more about um, collecting a large number and then filtering the good questions. If we do that, we can open up the question writing process to non-experts whose time may be available more cheaply and there are fewer bottlenecks in terms of required expertise. So we could even have students and instructors write questions. Then we're going to have to use some kind of algorithm to improve the uh, efficiency or the data efficiency with which we can evaluate these questions. How can we tell if the questions that we're collecting are actually good or, or not good? If we're using this expensive batch process, um, it's going to take us way too long to collect the data. So this then motivates um, the main body of this work. And you might be wondering, how do we turn assessment creation into something that we can apply an algorithm to, right? Assessments seem very soft and, and like there's a lot of details about humans that could get in the way of, of making this mathematical. Um, what we're going to do is we're going to treat each question as if it's a random variable. It's something that we can observe and it gives us information. And we're also going to assume that those random variables are discrete. So um, up at the top, we have a set of questions Question one, let's say I'm a public health researcher who wants to know what people know about the new COVID vaccine. I might ask, what is the active ingredient in the uh, modern COVID vaccines? And the set of possible outcomes could be whatever responses people give me. Maybe some people will say uh, it's a protein. Other people say it's mRNA. Another person says it's the mRNA encoding the spike protein on the coronavirus. Um, another person says it's the coronavirus. Another person says, I have no idea. And maybe there's an other category. I think you've got the chips, the microchips. Oh, right, right. Okay, so maybe another answer is it's microchips. So you have a question, you have this discrete set of outcomes. Question two might be, can you catch COVID by getting the vaccine? And people might answer yes or no. Those would be the uh, probably the only outcomes. Students, um, that is someone who's answering this assessment, are drawn from some joint distribution over all of those variables. And this is a really useful mindset to take because by looking at questions as random variables, we're able to bring a lot of mathematics and machine learning to bear on this problem because that's how we traditionally frame uh, stochastic data. So this may seem like it's a little prohibitive. We're talking about discrete random variables, but it actually captures most of the kinds of assessments that we're used to administering. Um, obviously, it covers forced choice questions like pick A, B, C, or D, um, but it also captures sort response questions as long as we can group the answers into equivalent sets. Uh, it captures select all style questions. It could even be used for rubric graded projects or um, other activities where there's some sort of um, performance criterion on a, a spectrum. 
Um, we could do survey style uh, Likert questions where people self rank on a scale, um, how they feel about something or what they think about something. Uh, we could even include quantitative performance metrics, like uh, how quickly did they accomplish something or how accurately did they do something. As long as we can bin it into discrete sets, it can be treated under this unifying framework. So what's about to happen is I'm going to tell you how we uh, mathematically operationalize what it means to make a good assessment. And what we're going to do is we're going to try and maximize the amount of information that we gain about a student from the questions we ask them. And you might reasonably ask, why is that a good idea? Well, the first thing is that we can't make good predictions about students if we don't have information about them. So it's a, a necessary condition for doing any other kind of educational prediction or activity. Um, the second reason is that uh, information gain is a fairly common objective for active sensing and active learning problems. And so we'll be able to draw on a set of techniques that already exist for addressing those kinds of uh, objective functions. So then you say, nice. And I'm going to say, well, well, hold on a second here, because one of the first results we'll get is that maximizing this objective function is NP hard. So uh, that's something we're going to have to contend with um, right off the bat. But without further ado, this is the objective function. And uh, I will admit, on first glance, this is a little overwhelming. Um, probably all the labels I've added hasn't helped. So we're going to step through this and try and break it down. It's actually not that complicated. Um, on the left hand side, all this says is that we're defining a utility function. That is how useful or how good an assessment algorithm is. And the algorithm is represented by the letter A. And this utility is defined with respect to a, a set of questions Q and a, a distribution of students S, um, maybe a, a particular collection of students. Now, what we're going to do, there's these two sums here. The first one is just averaging over the students. The second one uh, requires a little bit more discussion. So the algorithm is able to select up to K questions. So say there's a budget of 10 questions to find out as much as you can about each student. The algorithm is able to ask a question, observe the response of the student, and then pick what question to ask next up until it's asked K questions. The set of observations is that um, capital omega uh, shape, and that includes all of the students previously and the current student. The algorithm is able to use those observations to then make predictions about what a student will answer to any of the assessment items. So the second sum is just over all of the assessment items that the algorithm makes predictions about. Then the inner term is the difference between the information that we started with um, in terms of what potentially we could learn about the student and the information after we've made observations. And this difference is the information gain. It's what we've learned about the student in terms of uh, information, where information is uh, the mathematical entropy of the uh, distribution of student responses. Um, one thing to note is that the way that we measure the uh, entropy after observing student responses is uh, we actually use the, the cross entropy here. And so this has two effects in terms of what it drives the algorithm to do or, or what makes a good algorithm. A good algorithm has to not only ask useful questions that give us a lot of information about multiple assessment items, but it also has to make accurate predictions about the student responses um, based on the information that it's gained. And by combining these two, we'll be able to evaluate these algorithms really simply um, just by looking at some data sets and seeing how good the predictions are. Okay, so this is the first theory result of the talk. Uh, maximizing this performance objective is NP hard. And what that means is there's a very minuscule chance that we will be able to solve this exactly in a small amount of time for every possible instance of this problem. I'll just quickly sketch the proof, um, follows by a reduction from vertex cover. And the way that we build this, uh, this reduction is that we create a distribution where um, getting uh, querying a question gives you information about each of the edges that it's connected to. And uh, by creating that distribution, we can turn any vertex cover problem into an instance of our problem. So what this means for us, practically speaking, is that we're going to have to make some compromises. We can't be uh, fast and correct on every possible problem. 
And in general, this work is going to err on the side of being fast and general um, and potentially lose out a little bit on optimality. We may not have the exact best sequence of questions, but we're going to try and gain a, as much information as we can while still doing the computation quickly. So if I were to boil down the title of this talk to something digestible, it would be, can we make education better by using machine learning? And the short answer is yes, yes we can. Um, unfortunately, that's not enough for my thesis committee, so I have a slightly more specific statement of what this talk will uh, demonstrate. And that statement is, discrete graphical models of prerequisite relationships between assessment items can be learned from data, can be efficiently queried, and are useful for developing and administering novel computer science assessments of instructor-defined specificity using student-authored questions. So that's also a bit of a mouthful, um, but we'll be using a, a shortened form of that thesis statement as an outline for the rest of the talk. So to start off with, what are these prerequisite map things that I've alluded to? Arguably, the least controversial assumption about education is that some topics have to be taught before other topics. And this assumption is so widespread that it's built into every educational institution that exists. Uh, we use this assumption when we have course prerequisites. We use this assumption when we talk about different levels of schools, like undergrad and grad schools, or middle school and high school. It's even used in individual courses when you decide what order to cover topics in. It would be unthinkable for us to say, take a group of five-year-olds and expect to be able to teach them calculus before they know how to count. So this is an assumption that's very widespread and it seems like a reasonable place to begin if we want to start modeling what students know. Another interesting thing is that these kinds of prerequisite relationships have been statistically observed by scientific studies. Uh, so one example comes from algebra education. The ability to solve the equation on the top for x is strictly uh, easier or, or more accessible than the ability to solve the question on the bottom. Um, solving the, the bottom equation requires an additional skill of being able to add x to both sides or potentially you could multiply by a negative coefficient. But either way, there's an extra skill. And so there are you know, no students who, other than guessing, get the bottom equation right without being able to solve the first equation. So prerequisite relationships introduce this sort of one-way relationship um, between two topics. We can infer something along one of the directions, depending on whether or not the student got something correct or incorrect. So what that might look like if we mapped out a large number of topics is if we took measurements of one of the topics, say 11, and uh, 11 has two circles there to show that we've queried it, the student got it correct, therefore we can infer that they know all of the prerequisite knowledge. So questions 15 and 19, they must automatically know because they had to use that knowledge to answer question 11. On the other hand, if we ask them question eight and they get it wrong, we can infer that every question that requires that knowledge as a prerequisite, uh, they couldn't possibly get right. So that's question zero, one, two, three, and five. Now, I wanna take a quick aside and say that there is one other statistical model of assessment that we'll be directly comparing to in this work. And that work uh, is called item response theory. Um, and item response theory is fundamentally different from this idea of prerequisites. What item response theory assumes is that students have some latent ability along a single dimension and questions have some difficulty and a student's likelihood of being able to correctly answer a question depends on the difference between their ability level and the difficulty of the question. Um, in this most advanced form of item response theory, uh, there's also the ability to model the potential for guessing and to model questions that are more or less sensitive to differences in ability. Item response theory is fundamentally different from our prerequisite based approach because in item response theory, once you know the latent parameters, the responses to the questions are conditionally independent. Whereas in our setting, there is an explicit dependence between pairs of questions if they have a prerequisite relationship. Uh, furthermore, they only look at one question at a time or at sort of the group statistics as a whole. We're looking at pairs of items. Um, as a consequence, our prerequisite-based approach is going to be more computationally expensive, but hopefully more accurate. 
So um, the last thing I'll say here is that a prerequisite map is an arrangement of questions uh, into equivalent sets that have prerequisite relationships between them. So in this setting, questions one, two, and three are testing the same thing. They could be duplicate questions or they could be very simple rewordings of the same question. Um, either way, they're testing the same knowledge. Uh, question five is a prerequisite of that equivalent set of one, two, and three. So the goal of this work is going to be to build and then apply these prerequisite maps to inferring what students know. So how do we learn one of these things from data? An obvious place to start is to ask, can we identify a prerequisite relationship between a pair of items given some statistics about them? So if we have two questions, um, we can get them either both correct, that's A, both incorrect, that's D, or we can get one correct and one incorrect, or vice versa, so that's B and C. And uh, in this table, B and C are going to be really interesting statistics for us. If the two questions are identical, we would expect that there's zero likelihood of getting one, like, one correct and one incorrect. Um, if one is a prerequisite of the other, at least one of those will be uh, impossible. So uh, the prerequisite relationship implies, say, that it would be impossible to get Q1 correct without first understanding Q2. Finally, if the two items are independent, we would expect that both B and C have some likelihood of happening. So if we plot out these four different conditions, that they're identical, they have a prerequisite relationship one way or the other way, or the two items are independent, um, these are actually really easy to separate. We just check to see, is B zero, is C zero, are they both zero, or are neither of them zero? And we can easily distinguish what the relationship is between these two items. So the follow-up question is, can we determine the relationship if we're in the real world where students might guess or they might make mistakes or there might be uh, you know, grading errors or some other source of noise that means that our statistics aren't perfect? Well, if we add a little bit of noise, um, say 20% likelihood of guessing, which is a representative of say guessing one out of five answers on a multiple choice question, um, these categories are still somewhat separable if we look at the B and C statistics. And we could build a classifier that um, makes a distinction based on whether or not B and or C could have been generated by random noise or if they would require some additional amount of uh, likelihood. And if we use that classifier, we get pretty good accuracy. Um, there's a, a little bit of error on the boundaries between the categories, but for the most part, we can tell which uh, group or which relationship is which. Now the major drawback here is we have to assume a certain amount of noise. We have to know the amount of noise to determine if B or C could have been created purely by random noise. So now the question is, can we infer the relationship without being given the noise parameters? And what we're going to do here is we're going to try and guess some latent knowledge parameters, that's uh, bold K, and some latent guess and mistake parameters, that's bold G, for our pair of items, and then we're going to predict the relationship that that, or the um, distribution that would generate, um, that's D sub K comma G. And we're going to measure the difference between that generated distribution and the true distribution. And based on that, we're going to see if our knowledge and guess parameters are close to the truth um, and we found the right relationship or not. Well, if we try this, it does terribly. Um, we actually get really good KL divergence. The two distributions are basically perfectly matching, but it's using the wrong relationship most of the time. And why is that? Um, well, this is a problem that's over-parameterized. Uh, we only get four pieces of information, the numbers in A, B, C, and D, that is getting them both correct, both incorrect, or uh, one or the other. And uh, really that's only three pieces of information because the distribution has to add up to one. So with these three pieces of information, we're trying to estimate latent knowledge parameters for each question, so that's two parameters. We're trying to estimate guess likelihood for each question, so that's another two parameters. We're trying to estimate mistake likelihood for each question, so that's another two parameters. And then we're trying to determine the relationship between the, the two items. And so that's a total of seven parameters that we're trying to learn from three pieces of information. And uh, so we could, pick whatever relationship we want, and a lot of times we can exactly match the distribution just by tweaking all the other parameters. So how do we solve this? 
A common machine learning approach is to inject more assumptions or more priors into the problem. Um, and they're a form of regularization. They're a, a kind of preference over the type of solution that we get. And so what we do here is we multiply that KL divergence um, loss by two additional terms that account for our assumptions about the problem. So the first assumption is that the latent knowledge parameters are unlikely to be zero or one. Uh, they're they're gonna be closer to the middle in general. The second assumption is that the guess and mistake parameters should be small on average. Um, if we have a question that uh, say has a 0.75 chance of students uh, guessing it, then we have other problems, uh, right? Like the, the question is just no good. So we're gonna try and determine the relationships by including these assumptions and then seeing how the different models perform on this loss function. And if we do that, we actually get really good classification performance. We can identify the relationship between pairs of items with high accuracy. Um, and the only mistakes are, again, on the boundaries between these regions. Um, the other thing I'll say here is that this uh, method has a tendency to underestimate the amount of structure. So it's more likely to identify a prerequisite relationship or an unrelated relationship um, than to assume that two things are the same. And in the domain of application, that might be slightly preferable to assuming a lot of things about a student and then potentially teaching them uh, inefficiently. So then the, the follow-up question is, if we can measure these pairwise relationships, can we build or, or reconstruct a total structure um, given the statistics that we collect? And unfortunately, we can't evaluate this on educational data because we don't know the ground truth in education. We could certainly come up with a best guess, um, but we're going to run this experiment in simulation. And what we're going to look at is the prerequisite relationships in the uh, true model versus the prerequisite relationships that are identified in the constructed model. And we're going to see how large their overlap is. We're going to look at the number they have in common divided by the total number of prerequisite relationships across both uh, models. So the first experiment um, uses a chain DAG. This is highly structured. Um, every pair has a, a direct prerequisite relationship. And it does a decent job. Um, we do have some equivalence relationships with some noise as opposed to prerequisite relationships with some noise. Um, but we converge with a small number of students to mostly the right structure. The second experiment that we run is with a layered DAG. Uh, it's sparse. There's lots of um, pairs that don't have any relationship. And uh, again, there's a fair amount of noise in this problem. Um, here, we do okay. Um, there's a couple of important things to take away from the, the learned model. Um, the first is that, generally speaking, the smaller numbered terms are on the left and the higher numbered ones are on the right. So we are getting a fair number of the relationships correct. Um, and we sort of recovered some of the layer-wise structure, like the first layer is mostly correct. Um, that said, it sort of flattens out without um, getting to the, the perfect model. Uh, so even if we collected more statistics, there's a possibility that it, it wouldn't converge to the, uh, the correct underlying structure. But the real test will be, um, is this useful for making predictions about students? We may still be able to get high predictive accuracy and gain a lot of information about students, even if the structure is suboptimal. As a, another quick aside, um, this algorithm to build these from data runs fairly quickly. Um, it takes n squared space, where n is the number of questions. And uh, that should be unsurprising because there's n squared possible relationships. Um, the time complexity is n to the fourth. And uh, it's really unlikely that we'll be able to do better than that because we have to enforce the fact that there are no cycles between the relationships every time you process an edge. So we're processing n squared edges or n squared relationships. And we're also doing a check over the entire structure that all the existing relationships have been preserved. So now that we've talked about how we can build these things, how do we use them? How do we make inferences about students and make predictions about what they know? Well, the simplest version of this problem would be an entirely deterministic setting where we have some directed acyclic graph and we're able to query each question or each node. And we want to minimize the number of queries to label the entire graph, to separate it into known and unknown things or a left and a right set. So this is um, the DAG partition problem. 
And uh, surprisingly, it hasn't been studied in the uh, computer science theory literature. I was stuck on this problem for about a year and my, uh, my family were laughing at me because I kept talking about this DAG partition problem uh, that I was stuck on, um, but I did come up with a solution. So uh, the second major theory result of this work is that the greedy algorithm is actually very close to optimal. It's not optimal, um, but it's off by at most a logarithmic factor, which in computer science, that's pretty good. Um, the actual number of queries that it takes uh, is bounded by two times W, where W is the width of the DAG or the largest anti-chain. That's the set of items where there is no relationship between any pair of them, um, times the log of the number of queries. There is no algorithm that can do this problem um, faster than W because uh, if there's no relationship between any pair of those W items, then uh, you have to query each one in order to uh, label them. So um, the proof of this uh, involves a, a couple of bounds and is a little involved. I'm happy to talk about it um, more afterward, but the key takeaway here is that we can get an enormous improvement over sort of naively querying each node. If we leverage the DAG structure, we can efficiently partition um, most of these DAGs uh, in time that's logarithmic in the number of nodes, um, which is a really exciting result. So now we have this problem, right? We can do this efficient querying if we know what the DAG structure is, but uh, we don't know what it is to begin with, right? We'd have to collect some statistics. So there's this trade-off on our performance objective between using our samples of what students know to build a prerequisite map that we can then use to improve our performance on later students and actually using the prerequisite map to improve our performance. How do we balance learning the map versus using the map? Well, this trade-off is called exploration versus exploitation. And uh, it's something that comes up really commonly in reinforcement learning. And actually this problem closely resembles something called a multi-armed bandit problem. Uh, it's named after a row of slot machines. Uh, one slot machine is a one-armed bandit because it has one arm and it takes all your money. Um, so the multi-armed bandit problem is, let's assume we're in a fictional universe where there's some slot machines that would actually pay you out more than you put into play. How could you efficiently decide which machines to play? Like you might try one and it seems to be paying out a certain amount, but maybe the next one over is even better or the one after that is even better than that. How can you know when you should switch to a new machine versus when you should keep using the one that seems to be paying out the most? So I'm gonna tell you how to solve the multi-arm bandit problem, um, but first I have a quick word from one of our sponsors. Do you feel overwhelmed with choices? Do you have difficulty making decisions? Do you have difficulty balancing doing things you like and trying new things? Then you should try Thompson Sampling, a new product designed to increase your natural ability to make decisions. Thompson Sampling works by keeping a statistical history of your interactions with each possible action. It models the distribution of the mean reward of those actions and can even use those estimates to model the performance of an entirely new action. By sampling from those distributions and picking the one with the highest sample, Thompson Sampling is able to efficiently trade off exploration and exploitation by trying actions according to the likelihood that they are the best one. I always recommend Thompson Sampling for life's uncertainties. Side effects may include random behavior, unpredictability, small amounts of regret, statistics, Bayesian reasoning, modeling assumptions, and complicated mathematical analysis. Please talk to your doctor if you have a history of decision-making, your variance is bounded or may become bounded, you are able to compute means and variances, or you prefer reinforcement to supervision. Thompson sampling, make decisions with confidence. Okay, all jokes aside, Thompson sampling is an awesome algorithm. Uh, it's very simple, it runs very efficiently, and it basically performs optimally on the multi-arm bandit problem. Now, there's unfortunately a bit of an open question because Thompson sampling is designed to maximize reward. But in our setting, we're trying to maximize information. We're trying to get as much knowledge as we can about what students know. And so we have to test, does Thompson sampling actually work for selecting high information questions? And so this is what we're looking at right now. In the upper left, you can see that the amount of regret, the average regret, um, that is the amount of 
suboptimality in our decision making goes down over time. The total amount of regret as we continue this process for longer and longer starts to level off um, and starts increasing more and more slowly. And finally, in the bottom left, um, the x-axis is spreading out a set of assessment items based on the entropy or the amount of information that they can give us. And the y-axis shows the number of times that those uh, items have been tried or queried. And what we see here is that only the best item is really uh, explored a lot of the time. Um, the second item gets you know, maybe a thousand queries and the rest of them we barely try at all. So it has very quickly landed on the best action and uses it most of the time. Uh, Michael asked me to convert that last plot to a log plot to make it easier to see what was going on on the tail end. Um, so here the, the y-axis has been shifted and you can see that we try the best action about 10 times as much as the second best action. And that's a solid, uh, you know, maybe 10 times more than the next best action. Um, so Thompson sampling again has very quickly found the best actions and spends most of its time on them. So that brings us to the combined algorithm for building and using prerequisite maps. And this algorithm is called Thompson sampling of ordered prerequisites for information content or the topic algorithm. And if you're wondering, did I spend a lot of time thinking of this acronym? Yes, yes I did. So the topic algorithm is a very simple loop. We start by sampling pairwise relationships or pairwise distributions based on the statistics we've already collected. We use those relationships to build a prerequisite map and then we greedily query that map as if it were the true map for the given student. Once we've finished querying for a given student, we then have some new statistics based on which nodes we queried, and we use those to uh, update our distributions, which we then sample from, build a new map, and then query the next student. So we ran an experiment where we compare topic to item response theory, and uh, topic does much better. Um, it's able to collect a lot more information about students um, for each question that it uses. And so here we're increasing the number of queries that we allow it to make. And item response theory, it actually gets a head start. But what happens is the, the capacity of item response theory to model what students know um, it levels off because there's only a small number of parameters, the ability of the student and the difficulty of the questions. And once it's modeled that and asked a few questions, it has a pretty good idea of what it thinks the student's ability is. And then it doesn't get a lot more after that. Um, whereas uh, topic is able to recognize when questions are unrelated and is able to then continue querying questions and gathering more information. Okay, so prerequisite maps can be learned from data that can be efficiently queried. Are they useful for assessment? Now you might be thinking, you just ran this on an educational data set. Of course they're useful for assessment. Why, why is this another section? But the actual statement in the, the thesis statement was a little bit more specific. Um, my claim was that they're useful for developing and administering novel computer science assessments of instructor-defined specificity using student-authored questions. And this goes back to the motivating revisions yeah. to the process. Can I have a question for you, Sam? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, sorry, go, um, can we go back to the previous graph for a second? Yeah. So I see entropy baseline and item response theory, but I don't see the topic algorithm. So I think I'm missing something. Oh, it's, it's mislabeled. The entropy baseline is um, topic. Okay. <laughs> yeah, sorry okay. about that. Okay, thank you. Okay, so going back to the motivation for this section, um, the goal here is that this algorithm will enable us to quickly filter good questions from bad questions from a large pool that were generated by students and instructors as opposed to education research experts. So if you're a mathematical person who's very detail oriented and has really been loving all the theory results in the last section, I'm sorry to tell you that there's no new math here. Um, there's just a little bit of counting. But if you're a more qualitative person who likes looking at data and seeing what impressions you get, uh, I'm happy to tell you that we have some very promising proof of concept studies uh, in educational assessment generation. And let's say that you're a very abstract person and you don't care about the details at all, you just want the big picture. The real takeaway here is that these studies were cheap. 
generating an educational assessment that's useful for research would normally be the subject of an entire PhD dissertation. Uh, and in my case, we ran these in a couple of weeks and um, the results are pretty good. So this is a huge step forward in terms of the feasibility of generating assessments. So we're gonna run two proof of concept studies here. The first proof of concept is, can we generate an assessment that is comparable to the quality of an expert generated assessment? It doesn't really do any good for us to cheaply generate something that isn't as useful as an expert generated item. So we're gonna try and compare these two instruments. We're gonna be looking at how uh, frequently um, we detect misconceptions on our student population and what misconceptions we're able to capture. Um, we're also gonna look at what topics are covered and uh, again, how cheaply we were able to generate those results. So um, for a point of comparison, we chose to use an award-winning uh, expert instrument um, that is assessing programming knowledge in Java. Uh, it happens that a portion of this instrument overlaps with our CS18 course, and so we're able to pull some of the questions related to arrays and use them as a, a benchmark to compare our own generated questions against. So this is a typical question, or one of the questions from this expert instrument, uh, where there's a prompt at the beginning, um, there's a short program that students are asked to read, and then they have a set of options that they can select from. And depending on what option they select, that tells us something about whether they have a one indexing misconception at either the beginning or the end of the list. In contrast, our process, um, we have students generating questions. So what we asked them to do was write a short program in Java using arrays that would produce some output that could be printed to the console. The, the program would output uh, a simple answer. Other students were then asked to predict the output of that program. And they were then given the opportunity to compare their answer with a set of other answers provided by students. And we did that um, so that we could bin the answers into equivalence classes. Um, there were a lot of small uh, syntactic differences, like including quote marks or extra white space um, that weren't relevant to the understanding of the program. And by using this um, student binning process, we were able to get fairly accurate classification of the different answers. Um, students were also asked to give their rationale for the answers. So they had to give a short explanation of why they thought that was what the program would output. So how did this work? Well, we ran both the expert instrument and our process for generating instruments in a CS18 class. And ours is able to detect more misconceptions. It identifies them more frequently. Um, it detected a broader variety of misconceptions and it did it very cheaply. Um, and I wanna break these down a little bit more. The expert instrument theoretically can capture 12 misconceptions, um, but on our student population, only five actually occurred. And this suggests that there might be some additional benefit to our process um, in that we could generate instruments that are um, specific to a given population or accommodate the misconceptions prevalent in a given population. Additionally, um, ours was much more effective at detecting those misconceptions. Um, they came up much more frequently, um, almost six times as frequently. There were some differences between what was tested on the two assessments. The expert instrument had a question that had to do with memory allocation. And because of the way that we structured the questions that students wrote, um, that would be really hard to write a question about. Like, I'm not even sure how to write a program whose output would give an indication of what memory was allocated in Java. So um, probably the way that we designed this led to that question or questions like that not being generated. On the other hand, we were able to identify new topics um, definitely relevant to introductory students like a create, a, <laughs> array equality and uh, multiple indexing. Um, another interesting thing is that we were able to detect some cases where students didn't exhibit a misconception on one problem, but on a similar but slightly harder problem, they did exhibit that misconception. And I'll, I'll talk about that in a minute. Um, the final thing is that even though we've offloaded a lot of this work on students of generating questions, the burden on any individual student wasn't very large. So on average, they spent about 10 minutes writing a program, and then they spent about two minutes on each of a dozen uh, other programs um, providing the output or, or trying to figure out what it would do. So this is one of my favorite questions that was generated by a student. And the question involves a five-dimensional array. 
And uh, first of all, I would like everyone just to appreciate the um, diligence and the patience that a student had to exhibit to create this five-dimensional array. Um, basically, every dimension splits the array into two pieces. And so there's a total of two to the fifth or 32 elements, and they're numbered from one to 32. And then all that the program does is output the element at index one, 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 one. Now, the majority of the students got the correct answer of 32. And uh, some students made some mistakes. They lost count, like the answer of 16 or like 30 or 28, 31. Most of those people would have gotten it if they you know, hadn't lost their place. But what's really interesting here is about 20% of the students exhibited a one indexing misconception. The answer one is consistent with believing that array indexing starts at one and not zero. And uh, what's also interesting is all of these students took the expert instrument and answered questions on the generated instrument that would have detected a one indexing, one indexing misconception on a one dimensional array. And so this is a case we think of fragile student knowledge. The students are able to correctly reason through a one dimensional case, but when we get to this multi-dimensional case, uh, their, their reasoning breaks down um, and they default to this, uh, this misconception. The other possibility um, is that the way that the items are labeled uh, also contributes to the misconception. So if the numbers had gone from zero to 31, it's possible we might have seen different results. But either way, this is a, a misconception that we were able to detect with this question um, that we wouldn't have detected otherwise. The other thing I want to highlight here is there's some really interesting mental models from students who probably haven't seen multidimensional arrays before. So the students who answered D seem to think that the index one item from each row is going to be output. And the students who answer E seem to think that the first row is going to be output five times. And if you're an instructor working with these students, knowing what these mental models are can give you a good starting place for trying to address that misconception and teach them how arrays actually behave in Java. Okay, so we do pretty well compared against this expert instrument, but what about generating new instruments, right? From a scientific point of view, the last study was really useful. From a practical point of view, I mean, we made another introductory CS assessment. Can we do this with new topics? So we decided to run a study um, testing knowledge of linear temporal logic in uh, Brown CS's logic for systems class. And our goal here is to look at uh, the misconceptions that we detect and the prerequisite map that we build and see if it tells us something that's pedagogically informative. The way that we structured the study is that we asked students to write a short English expression that specifies an LTL formula. Linear temporal logic is an extension of first order logic that has operators um, like globally and finally that allow you to reason over an infinite set of temporal uh, values or an infinite sequence of uh, states. And so students would write an English specification and then other students would be asked to translate that specification into an LTL formula. Based on the responses to students um, of students, we were able to identify a large number of linear temporal logic misconceptions. Um, one of the most prevalent was the assumption that a statement implicitly applied globally. Um, and we'll look at that in the next slide. Um, but there's also a number of other misconceptions that we detected. Um, one of the other interesting ones is that the implies statement uh, also means next. And so whatever is on the right hand side of implies also applies to the next time step, um, which isn't how it actually works, but it is how a lot of students seem to think that LTL worked. So to look at these in, in detail, on seven of the 12 um, best questions on this generated LTL instrument, we observed a uh, implicit global misconception. On the left-hand side, you can see the, the correct formula. Um, and on the right-hand side, you see formulas that students provided that were consistent with this implicit global um, misconception. And their uh, reasoning, their explanations um, is consistent with that. And so you can see on all of these pairs, um, the left-hand side has some G that applies to a, a large portion of the um, expression. And on the right-hand side, that G is missing. On four of the top 
12 questions, um, we also had this implication also means next misconception. So again, on the left hand side, you can see the correct expression. On the right hand side, there's an X missing where X represents the next time step. So what about the prerequisite map? Do we learn anything interesting about the relationships between these questions? That's a little bit harder because we don't have a ton of data. As we increase our required level of confidence in the discovered relationships, the number of relationships that we're confident in goes down. But if we look at one of these prerequisite maps, um, it does tell us some interesting things. In general, the simpler formulas are on the left and the more complicated formulas are on the right. So there does seem to be some sort of um, increasing in difficulty with the complexity of the required formula. The other thing that's interesting here is two of the questions actually had identical correct answers, and those get grouped together by this particular prerequisite map. Okay, so we've now shown that we can uh, reproduce the quality of an expert instrument, and we can generate novel instruments cheaply using this process. So I'd like to take this opportunity to draw out some of the big ideas, some of the main themes that make this work. The first thing is that we're able to operationalize uh, the problem of making assessments mathematically by treating questions like random variables. And even though that's not really a, a result in itself, it's an um, assumption or an interpretation that leads to the rest of this work. And the rest of the work wouldn't be possible without taking that step. Um, the second thing is that because this is an NP-hard problem, um, we do have to make compromises. And what we've picked is a particular point on this frontier of being efficient, but also fast. Um, item response theory is faster, but a little less accurate. Um, whereas you could imagine building a much more complicated, uh, you know, complete Bayesian inference algorithm that might have much better accuracy, but wouldn't run in, uh, you know, into the fourth time. It might be even more expensive. And so this is really um, the point where we're doing as much as we can by looking at pairwise relationships between items. And uh, again, it's entirely possible some other algorithm that's more complicated could perform better, but we have something that is tractable for the number of assessment items we might expect on a fairly large assessment in an individual class. Um, the third thing is that we've injected a lot of domain knowledge in order to keep this problem tractable. We've uh, chosen to focus on prerequisite and equivalence relationships between items. Um, we've applied some regularization in terms of assumptions about there being small amounts of noise. And we were able to use those in order to improve the generality and the accuracy of our results. We use Thompson sampling to prioritize high information questions, um, which is a fairly novel approach to a somewhat common objective. So there are lots of machine learning and reinforcement learning in particular problems where um, information gain is, is an objective. And uh, we've used Thompson sampling to try and optimize that objective, uh, which is reasonably novel. The last thing is that we've used students in multiple ways. Not only did we use them to generate questions, but we also used them to group the responses to those questions in order to run all of our statistical process. And this idea of using readily available um, resources, uh, one is great computationally, but it turns out it may also have pedagogical benefits. Um, there's a body of research around something called contributing student pedagogy that suggests that having students say right questions may actually be beneficial for them in terms of learning as well. There are definitely some limitations to this work, uh, some assumptions that we made. So one is that we try and model everything with this flat prerequisite structure. And uh, there is a limit to the size of the assessment that we could model. In real life, humans deal with this complexity by applying hierarchical abstractions. So in a given course, there might be topics which are organized into units. Um, courses are organized into sequences and then into majors and then into schools. Um, and then uh, you know, schools are organized even into uh, degree programs and, and other um, structures. And so it's possible that a hierarchical extension to this model could um, improve the time complexity of approximately querying a very large structure. The second possible extension is looking at um, cases where student answers might change across time. Uh, this could be due to, say, forgetting, or it could be due to learning as a result of trying some of the previous exercises. 
Um, we don't approach that problem here, but it's possible that prerequisite maps could help us to efficiently make inferences in those settings. So to summarize, <clears throat> Allow me to recap in a wrap the plan of attack as we tackle assessment with prerequisite maps. Let me flash back to the relevant tracks and unpack and extract the facts and attach an itty bitty flow so my committee will know this pretty witty ditty isn't just for show. It's really your view with lyric conjugation a better education by specific computation. I'm talking ML and not my advisor, learning from students how to teach a little wiser for application at scale to make education rock. I'll be taking a page from my man, Stephen Bach. Are we able with less labels to learn what learners know? Self-supervision is the only way to go. Inspired by the best, we choose quite sensibly to maximize our gain in information entropy. Too bad for us, we'll incur complexity. It's NP hard, can't optimize it perfectly. We watch the deduction, hopes burst asunder, the proof by reduction from vertex cover. So we compromise, we agonize, we theorize, we analyze, we energize this enterprise to emphasize the organized prerequisite pairs. So prevalent that there's a resonant sentiment in schools everywhere. I modeled prerequisites with Evan and Michael modeled by directed graphs without cycles, the vital arrival of a tractable technique made radically practical, tactical machine, learning for inferring the relationships between the items we're assessing while we're testing everything. How do we detect some questions connections? How can we inspect the perspective directions to find firsts and seconds and identify identities and also to detect when they're independent entities? Threshold based rules, they seem like the best, but success is only blessed with access to the guess and mistake parameters. So as great examiners, we build Bayesian handlers to estimate parameters to ensure the emergence of a locale divergence. We desire some priors to satisfy that purpose. It seems that that extreme values seldom arise, so monotonic functions help us regularize. Lost my place. Then we snag a rad dag that captures equivalence, modeling from data, our created instruments. We do our due diligence and plan with composure to keep our graph sound with the transitive closure. Now here's a problem for a mathematician. Minimize the queries for a DAG partition? Greedy is so easy, and it's nearly the best for efficiently exploiting known prerequisites. But how do we unscramble the stochastic bramble? Explore or exploit? Just Thompson sample. The topic alg just samples edges, then builds a graph for inferences, greedily queries and predicts from stats the probability that a student knows that in a benchmark comparison to IRT. Topic beats item response theory as intelligent specialists. It's evident the estimates benefit from relevant elements, precedents. The experiment shows the preeminence that follows the development of prerequisite maps. It's time that we put our assessments to the test. Can we do this with questions that students suggest? An expert instrument on arrays in Java in a baseline experiment to appraise errata in a blaze of drama on our desiderata surrenders like a robot to our assessment armada. We can all agree on the savvy contestant. Special thanks to Sriram with Kathy and Preston. For a new topic, we picked LTL, then collected some data with the help of Tim Nelson. Students misconceived the need for a G. Some of them believed it was there implicitly. Another surprise was what implies meant next, but now we can address the perplexities expressed by suggesting some corrections and testing the effects. I'm an R&D artist that's rhythm and development, not trying to be smart, it's just when I'm in my element, I find there is a benefit to writing rhyming speech and things for explaining all the evidence expected of a PhD, doctor of philosophy. But honestly, ironically, my primary quality is virtuosic prosody. I'm a shocker to monotony, a scholar of verbosity. I offer no apologies and don't tolerate dichotomies between the technical and comedy, identical in novelty, no pathetic mediocrity. So I'm offering to constantly speak the truth, mislead the youth like the authors of philosophies. I promise that I won't be like the others that killed Socrates. You've heard my ideas, my reasons and their treatments, and hopefully this pleases even when it wasn't genius. Thank you all for listening. It's been facetious but intense. And thank you all for coming to my thesis defense.
I swear you could have buried a hundred errors in there and nobody would know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I said beforehand that you would not be hearing a rap. I did not know that you would be hearing a rap. You did in fact hear a rap. All right then. So uh, I feel a little off my game now, but let's see. Uh, I should have said in the beginning what the procedure would be. Now I feel like I have to say it in prosody, but um, I make it all rhyme, but I don't have the time. So what I'm trying to get across here is that normally what we would do is we'd have the talk and you can ask clarification questions during the talk. And we did some of that, but I probably shouldn't have told you that in advance. Now is an opportunity to ask some questions. Some people have to go, thank you Stephanie for being here, um, to uh, just follow up with Sam, questions that came up from, from the talk. Then we're going to break out into a breakout room with just the faculty and Sam. And we'll be there for a little while grilling Sam. Then we'll send Sam back out to the main room. The faculty, I guess, will grill each other uh, because Sam won't be there anymore. And we will uh, return to the main room with uh, a result. So this would be a time to ask some questions if people want to do that. There were some questions in the chat, though I think we, I think we interrupted and actually uh, followed up on that. So I don't think we have any left there. Uh, we, <laughs> we are a little bit over in terms of time. Is, is, does anybody have anything pressing that you want to ask Sam while you have a chance? I mean, the, current, the tradition here is we let people who are not on the committee and non-professors go first so that because then those who want to leave can leave and we, we will stick around. But. Yes, indeed. Well, let me lead off with a question while we're waiting for the others, Sam. Uh, so I suspect many people here don't know the history of item response theory, right? Which is quite fascinating. It was developed actually by the ETS to help figure out what questions to ask because you don't want to ask everybody the same question that'd be cheating, et cetera. So they want to ask different questions, but they want to give everybody a roughly equally difficult exam, right? That's a nutshell version of it. So I'm wondering if you had the right, I mean, burning down the ETS would be a good start, but assuming that that's not within our powers, um, if you had the right to like go off and redesign the way something like the SAT was administered, um, what using your work instead, um, what do you what help us understand what would be different about that new exam that uses your methods rather than item response theory? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so first of all, my exam would be shorter. Uh, the SAT is a pen and paper exam, and so even though not all students are getting the same questions, for given batch of questions. It doesn't matter how you answered the ones before, you still have to answer other let's questions. you have an electronic version. Yeah. I mean, I think they do, and let's assume they do anyway. Once we've gotten to that point, um, I think there's some fundamental differences in what we're measuring and why. So the SAT is really trying to give colleges a really easy way of selecting a group of students, and it, it doesn't even have to do maybe the best job at that, as long as it makes its answers very clear. The student got a score of, you know, 1300, the student got a score of 900, take the 1300 student, colleges don't question that. I'm a lot more interested in the details, right? I don't want to reduce student knowledge to a single score. I want to know, do they understand algebra? Do they understand biology? Do they understand elementary chemistry? Um, can they read? Like those are things that should be broken down even more, right? So uh, understanding algebra, maybe you're great with systems of linear equations, but not with quadratic equations. So there's an increased level of granularity here. Um, that's one thing. Um, the yeah, other thing- let me, play, let me play devil's advocate there, right? I think that it's still a question of what the ITS chooses to publish, right? I mean, they have some market reason by which they want to publish a single number, but they have the individual answers. They could in principle provide, you know, like the ETS can turn into a more general testing service and could provide a transcript instead. So assume that the ATS can do that. I'm, I'm still trying to drive at the difference in item response theory and what you have. Right, right. right? Especially based on the Thompson sampling and the graph, et cetera, right? Yeah. That's, so I'm trying to get the heart of that. So make some reasonable assumptions about what the ETS could be doing with item response theory and then try to answer with that. Yeah. So I think one thing is that um, it can clearly distinguish distinct areas of knowledge without requiring an expert to go in and categorize them. So like the SAT, for example, they test math and English on separate tests. 
And the reason for that, other than avoiding confusion, is the fact that if they threw them all together, item response theory would break because it's trying to measure English ability and math ability on the same scale. So that required an expert to go in and say, these are different things, we're going to test them separately. When they design questions, they go in and create um, topics that they decide they're going to specifically test. And again, that requires expertise. Our approach requires almost no expertise. We can take a bunch of questions written by students, written by instructors, and automatically detect when items are unrelated. Um, another major difference is that um, we don't have, well, okay, so in terms of um, like practical differences, one is that the item response theory has a single axis of skill. And in order to have multiple axes, you have to create multiple tests. Mm -hmm. um, but another difference uh, is that we're, our tests could be more accurate. Um, given enough statistics, we might actually be able to better estimate what students know than item response theory because our modeling assumptions might be um, you know, more effective and require less expertise. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. All right, very good. Uh, any non-committee members want to chime in, ask a question? Can I ask a question? Oh, I would, I would appreciate that. Well, good work, Sam. Good seeing you again. Um, my question has to do with the amount of training maybe you had to give for students to kind of provide these examples. I mean, how many of them didn't work or just amount of work involved there? Thank you. Yeah, so um, in terms of getting the students to generate interesting questions, we did iterate on the process a couple of times. We got some interesting results the, the first time, but it was hard to... Um, some of the questions were testing things that were maybe not interesting pedagogically. So one of the things that we learned pretty quickly is that we wanted to emphasize that the programs be short. If you tell students that they should be generating complicated examples, then uh, they'll sit down and come up with the most convoluted problems possible. And then we're mostly observing noise in terms of what details students caught instead of fundamental uh, understanding and misconceptions. Um, we did give them some priming examples uh, in terms of like, here's a short program that produces an output. Um, the other thing is that on uh, some of the studies that we ran, we ran more studies than I, I presented here. Um, we actually had students contribute questions after seeing questions provided by other students. And we did seed the pot with a, a few uh, questions written by instructors. And so the body of questions were, um, of a similar flavor, similar style, again, in terms of complexity and in terms of the kinds of the things that were being um, measured. Then in terms of constructing the data, um, all of the classroom studies were run with a, a single classroom. So um, all of the questions were written by a single class, all of the answers were provided by that class, and then um, we ran the, the statistics based on that. The um, larger scale studies used some education data sets that were run. Uh, so like the fraction subtraction data set involved 500 students across a, a variety of middle school classes. Um, but that was the largest study that we ran in terms of um, number of data points. Thank you. Hi, I have a quick question. Um, so are you surprised that the excellent Brown students actually didn't show any misconceptions in the Java array? Uh, questionnaire? So I do think that the expert instrument was probably designed for a, uh, I don't know how to put this tactfully, maybe a population with less background on average. And uh, so I, I do think it's the case that on a different population, the Brown generated questions might not be the best. But um, I do believe that we could generate a set of questions on that different population that are probably as good or better than the expert instrument. One of the things I really want to highlight is that um, the questions that, like the, the multi-dimensional array question, for example, catches one indexing misconceptions where a unidimensional array question does not. And so regardless of the population, that's probably a more informative question um, for an assessment. Cool, thank, thank you. you. Um, I have a small follow-up to this. Um, I agree that the specificity that this method allows is, I think, the awesome, cool result. Um, are there any like plans in the works to either offer this at other universities or maybe like an online learning environment? 
Yeah, so we're currently looking, um, obviously there's some other classes in Brown CS that are um, using this or planning to use it. Um, I've also been in contact with a professor in chemistry who's planning on using it. There are enough like rough edges that uh, it's not publicly available yet, but that is definitely a, a goal for the near future. One of the things that's a little bit challenging is figuring out how to write good prompts. So we chose to structure the Java arrays assessment um, around students writing uh, short programs. And we chose to structure the LTL uh, assessment around students writing um, English specifications of what should be a short formula. It's not totally clear how to generalize that to very open-ended questions. Um, we did run a study where we had students think of um, security exploits for uh, generic systems or um, flaws in machine learning systems. And the results were interesting, but very difficult to analyze in an automated fashion because the responses had many different features and were difficult to group together. So um, again, because of that, it's not publicly available yet, but that is a plan for the near future. All right, Asia has her hand up. I did, I think you just answered it. This, first of all, awesome presentation. Thank you so much for all your research. I think my question was really a piggyback off of that one. Um, I wanted to hear what your vision was. Was this, you know, is this solely for uh, computer science, uh, college age students? Do you think that this is something that's useful in the, you know, in primary education, K through 12? You know, I'm thinking of just Providence. We have STAR, which is a standardized test and students are, essentially they're tracked in their progress. I'm just wondering what would be the implications of such a, of such research when it comes to student progression um, K through 12. And I'm not sure if that was part of the vision, but I think you kind of answered it. So I was, I was literally about to put my hand down. Well, I can still um, speak to that a little. Um, thanks Asia. So the, the first thing is that um, there are some practical constraints around running the generating process. Um, for one thing, all the students have to be able to type they have to have computer access and they have to be independent enough that they can work on an assignment mostly by themselves for about half an hour. And so doing this with elementary school students, I think could be difficult for reasons entirely unrelated to the data processing and collection tasks. Um, that said, I think it's entirely possible that we could generate an instrument and then deploy a, a semi-static version of that instrument, um, even for some of those uh, more tightly constrained populations. So for example, I, I could easily see eventually generating um, say standardized math exams or science exams or even like English or reading exams um, for younger age populations where we generated the assessment under slightly more controlled conditions but then are able to deploy this um, dynamic assessment uh, system without asking students to write questions. In terms of applicability to different subject areas, um, there's basically no assumptions on the mathematical side that this has to be computer science, but computer science is a really nice area to be doing education research in for a couple of reasons. Um, one is that we have access to the ground truth. Everything in computer science is made up, including the languages and the language semantics. And so we can verify uh, easily and, and simply whether or not, say, a program does produce a particular output or whether or not uh, a particular function does produce a particular result. Um, that's a lot harder in something like, um, you know, maybe writing composition where determining if something is the right answer is uh, substantially harder. Um, there are some approaches to like pure grading that could um, give us a handle on that or uh, using some sort of rubric system. Um, but again, that's sort of an additional hurdle. Um, but that aside, there are lots of, uh, I think, fairly specific questions with a strong notion of correctness where we could easily apply this uh, in the near future. So again, like I'm talking with a professor of chemistry who's interested in looking at um, basic chemistry knowledge, including things like um, uh, balancing reaction equations, uh, working with unit conversion, um, understanding uh, like acid-base reactions and uh, identifying simple molecules. Um, and so those are all problems that would be approachable with uh, this technology. And thank you so much. And I think this technology could also be useful in engaging not just college readiness, but also you know, thinking of like first generational students and science readiness and them going into STEM, uh, the STEM, uh, you know, realm. I think this is also a very, oh, yeah. very great software to consider. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. I think, you know, one of my primary motivations here is not really to evaluate the students so much as to enable effective pedagogy. 
Um, you know, one of the, what started me on this actually is, uh, you know, I had some things I didn't understand and I went to YouTube and I tried to find a video and the video used a bunch of terms I didn't understand. And then I was like, well, now I'm just stuck. Like, I don't know what to do at this point to get from where I am to what I want to learn. And, you know, my goal for this work is that this will enable um, really simple and, and transparent personalized education by addressing what students know and what prerequisites they're missing um, so that then they can sort of follow the, the planned um, curriculum. All right, very cool. So um, what I'd like to happen next is I'd like Sam to make uh, Lucas the host. For those who don't know, Lucas uh, and Sam actually started their PhDs with me at around the same time. Lucas is my most recent person to defend successfully, though hopefully he will be supplanted in a little while, but we'll see. Um, but if you can make Lucas the host, then uh, Lucas can send the faculty and Sam into a breakout room and we can, uh, you know, do the secret part. Great. It always seems so <laughs> fancy. And uh, Lucas, if you can make me a co-host, I think that will let me share my slides in the breakout room. Oh, okay. Great work, by the way, Sam. Uh, thank you. Are you... Oh, wait. Are you co-host? Uh, yes, thank you. <laughs> <laughs>